Um, Meredith, thanks very much uh, for uh, um, organizing this event with Toki and uh, um, thanks very much for inviting me uh, and uh, Noriko, I'm very happy to be here um, and to talk about some joint work that um, uh, we've been doing with Lorenzo Doctor, who is uh, in Granada in Spain, and Anya Pruma, who was formerly a postdoctoral fellow here in Cambridge and is now at uh, Queen Mary in London. Um, so this is a project we started um, just prior to the Me Too movement. And uh, we ran uh, into what, what's been a very important um, development. So um, let me... Uh, so to set the stage, um, so I think this paper and this project is about gender, but many of the issues we are going to uh, bring up here could easily be somehow, you know, posed in the context of race and, and probably other dimensions of identity. Uh, but with that general comment, let me uh, get us back to the gender um, so, as is probably uh, so very widely uh, in, in many parts of the economy, many parts of society, uh, participation of women in different sort of working uh, sectors has, has changed and so has performance. There has been a lot of interest in trying to understand, um, you know, uh, issues of performance, especially. Uh, in particular, we are interested in participation in knowledge intensive sectors. Um, so it could be law or, you know, it could be IT or uh, uh, one of the, uh, in general, it's reasonably easy to, uh, to trace participation rates. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to uh, measure performance because for, for a variety of reasons, it's generally very difficult to measure performance because one reason is often performance uh, happens at the unit level or the department level or at the organization level and it's hard to unpack and, and sort of assign contributions. Um, so what we were particularly interested in was to understand uh, how performance has, has changed over time and we wanted to look at um, uh, we, we, we want to look at a context where performance could be measured very concretely. Um, as uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at uh, economics research and we're going to look at the productivity of men and women um, in economics research. Um, now, of course, we all know um, that in addition to research, um, equally importantly, um, we, uh, we are engaged in education and in teaching. And uh, there has been uh, very recently also a great deal of research actually in understanding how um, students evaluate uh, men and women in economics teaching. And uh, so, you know, the question and answer time, I, I, you know, if you have some questions on that, we can get back to that. But this project is going to focus on research productivity. So the first, uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to confirm is, as you might have expected, if you look at the universe of economists uh, over a 50 year period from 1970 to 2017, roughly 47 years, roughly 50 years, five decades, you see uh, a, a picture which is probably familiar from many other um, industrial industry sectors, you know, uh, that the fraction of women who are doing research has gone from under 5% to close to 30%. Okay, so this is um, important to bear in mind and it's probably in line with, you know, what you might have expected. Um, here's the productivity um, uh, picture. So what we're doing here is on the x-axis, I've just plotted time and on the y-axis, um, I'm doing something very simple. I'm just looking at the number of papers that men and women publish. And what's, what is being plotted here is the ratio of the number of papers that women publish on average um, uh, as a fraction of the number of papers men publish on average. And what's interesting here is that, um, so 
this ratio, uh, just to be sure, uh, you know, we, we understand what this ratio, what this ratio is saying is um, that roughly women are producing um, 0.75. So the ratio is they, pu they publish roughly three quarters uh, of the number of papers that men do. And interestingly, uh, this ratio has remained fairly stable um, since 1995. It's, it's barely moved, even though the fraction of women has gone up uh, very sharply. Now, one can, of course, measure productivity, you know, in rough, raw numbers, like what we've done here. And one could measure it more in terms of quality weighted. So some research is clearly more important than other research. And one could do something like that. But for the purposes of this talk, I think this is a good starting point. And, and let's just keep this picture in mind. And this should raise questions. It should actually be a source of some concern uh, that so little has changed over the last uh, 25 years in spite of the growth in the fraction of women doing research in economics. So, so this is the point of departure for us. And what we are doing is we are trying to explore in this paper uh, possible reasons why uh, men and women might be um, uh, might the productivity might be so stable in spite of the changes in the fraction of the participation rate. So what we are going to do is there are different avenues you know which we could explore. In, in this talk, I'm going to be exploring um, uh, one sort of natural avenue, which is what are the patterns of collaboration that men and women have? Are there measurable and, and robust and stable differences in the patterns of collaboration. In particular, what we mean by collaboration is going to be how men and women co-author. And since co-authoring and collaboration, scientific collaboration is increasingly the norm in economics, uh, this is going to be uh, a natural thing to be looking at. Is it the case that men and women have very different patterns of collaboration? Um, so what sort of, uh, why are we thinking about collaboration? Well, uh, what could be the pathways or the routes through which collaboration could matter? Well, if you have many more collaborators, you probably run into more ideas, uh, you know, while they're still new uh, compared to someone who has no collaborators at all. Um, similarly, if you have uh, co-authors who also co-author with each other, uh, maybe you know you form cohesive communities, and it's easier to maintain high standards, high norms of cooperation. Um, and and so you might think that having more collaborators might give you access to new ideas uh, faster, which is very important. Uh, but at the same time, having many overlapping collaborations might make it easier for you to continue to collaborate and and to successfully maintain high standards. So um, uh, finally, of course, uh, we might think that if we work with the same people over and over again, um, there may be again some positive aspects to that because we can uh, have high trust. On the other hand, there may be less originality and creativity and novelty if you keep working with the same people as compared to working with you know, a wider range of co-authors. So with those sort of uh, uh, you know, background considerations, Let's look at what the data says and, and, and let's look at, um, let's try and measure these network features. Okay, so I'm going to use um, this uh, terminology. I'm going to say degree to refer to the number of co-authors you have. I'm going to say strength of tie to refer to the number of papers that you write with someone. And clustering is simply going to be the number of triangles. This looks a, a little uh, overwhelming. So let me just uh, give you, um, illustrate these three uh, by looking at the networks. So what's a network here? It's going to be um, the authorship ties that uh, people have. So I'm going to be looking at 10 year periods and to make everything very concrete, I'm going to be looking at the networks of three uh, prominent economists. Uh, in fact, they won the Nobel Prize last year for development uh, experiments in development economics. And so um, let me you know, show you those networks. So, so they won the prize in 2019. It's fair to say they won it because of 
you know, the work they did in the decade from 2000 to 2009, uh, that was the, uh, you know, the foundation for the, for the prize. What I have here in this, on this slide is the network of Esther Duflo. Many of you I'm sure have heard of her. Um, so what, what is this picture telling us? It's telling us that she had over the decade, 2000 to 2009, she had 19 co-authors. Uh, so these are the nodes in yellow. Um, and we also, we can see that some of those relationships are, are um, you know, are very, uh, they're broad. And, and that means there are many papers sitting on those ties, whereas others are thin. So it could be a single paper. Uh, that's a strength of ties. And then we have clustering, which is the number of triangles. And notice there are many triangles um, in these graphs, uh, which suggests, you know, and the clustering is high. You will see in a moment that the two other laureates had very different clustering. Okay, so here's a second. Um, this is the um, network of Abhijit Banerjee, who uh, also won the prize last year. And we see, first of all, that his degree, the number of co-authors, is larger. It's 22. Uh, we also see his clustering is, is uh, a lot smaller. It's 0 0.09 as against 0 0.14. Okay, so we're beginning to get a first impression of how, and, and I should probably add that Abhijit and Esther are a couple. In fact, a lot of their work is joint work. Uh, but in spite of that, you can see uh, a, a clear difference in the network that the two have. And this is uh, made more clear when I look at the third uh, person who won the Nobel Prize last year. This is Michael Kramer. Uh, and you see his degree is even higher. In fact, his degree is 34, uh, which is 50% um, higher than Abhijit Banerjee's degree. And his clustering is negligible. Okay, it's really 0 0.04. It's less than half of the clustering of Abhijit Banerjee and less than one third of the clustering of Esther Duflo. Uh, so I think that should give you a first impression of what you might, you know, how you might uh, start thinking about collaboration networks. More generally, you might think about networks between men and women being different. So this sort of a pattern has also been observed, uh, for instance, when you think about um, networks of friendships that men and women have in organizations. So this is not somehow uh, you know, this has been noted by other researchers, uh, women tend to have fewer, um, uh, you know, collaborators or um, friends or, you know, colleagues they feel comfortable with. And one could ask, for instance, similar questions about uh, the networks of men and women on Facebook. Okay, and there has been research on that. And you can, you know, after my talk, you can probably take a look at that on, on, on the internet. So, so how particular are these three researchers? The paper essentially tells us that these three features of their networks, uh, the degree, the clustering, and the strength of ties, obtains generally across all uh, over the 50 year period uh, over men and women on average. So this is the picture for the difference in degrees. And we see that the difference in the number of authors has grown between men and women slightly. Um, the strength of ties, we see that women have stronger ties on average, and um, we see that uh, women have higher clustering than men. It's also worth noting that these patterns are fairly stable across time. So this, of course, uh, goes towards some, some ways towards understanding why patterns in productivity differences uh, might be so stable and so, so um, in spite of the increase in the fraction of women. So just to uh, wrap up uh, the discussion, uh, we've also looked at sociology, which as you might, uh, you might expect, is a profession where uh, the fraction of women is much higher. So this confirms that point that the fraction of women is close to you know, half half, uh, which was a lot higher than for, for economics. But in spite of this, uh, sociology has similar uh, issues about productivity. Again, we are looking just at the number of papers and we see that if anything, the fraction, the relative productivity of men and women has been very stable, but if anything, it's actually fallen off over the last uh, 10 years or so. So again, this is a source of uh, serious concern. Um, we looked at the network 
differences between men and women in sociology. And again, we found very similar differences as in economics. So um, how, how am I doing for time, Meredith? I've run out of time, right? Okay, okay. So let me, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk much about, um, you know, how we explain it and maybe it'll come up in the question and answer session. Um, let me, so since I'm out of time, let me leave you with this slide. We have shown that as in many other knowledge intensive sectors, the share of women um, doing research in economics has grown. Uh, uh, and, and, but the productivity difference has remained very stable. And we have tried to present some network based um, explanations for why uh, one might, uh, how one might think about these differences in, um, in productivity. So I think I'm going to stop because I'm out of time. Thank you very much.